Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Merenke. I'm the research director of the German Council on Foreign Relations. I'm the moderator of this session today, of this event, which is on the future of NATO's nuclear deterrence posture, a topic which is, of course, always timely, but especially uh, with regard to the fact that my home country, uh, where I'm sitting at, Germany, is going to have elections and nuclear topics um, not always, but this time may feature into the debate, may not be kind of relevant with regard to who wins the election, but it is a topic that uh, helps parties to distinguish between each other on where do you stand on the on the nuclear issue side. So therefore, I'm very much uh, I'm grateful to to NATO for the suggestion, just have a little bit of a discussion about that to inform of what NATO thinking about it is and also how you can think alternatively possibly about it. That's the reason why uh, we invited our speakers today, which is first of all, uh, Jessica Cox, who is the director of NATO nuclear policy. Uh, she will give us a broad overview of uh, NATO principles on, uh, uh, on nuclear deterrence. Next in this round will be Bruno Tertre, who is the deputy director of the Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique in Paris. Very beautiful place, and uh, he is a, not only a beautiful, but a giant expert on the nuclear topics. And I hope it gives us a little bit of the French perspective, which is not always 100% a NATO perspective. But I guess that's also an important perspective because the Franco-German dimension sometimes has a relevance with regard to questions of whether it's an alternative um, or not. Next, it's uh, Moritz Quitt from the Hamburg Institute for Peace Research and Security Policy. Uh, a warm welcome to you. And uh, it's good to, to have you as somebody who has a... I guess represents a very important voice in the in the German debate. Um, and last but not least, it's Brad Roberts, who is the director of the Center for Global Security uh, Research at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. And uh, Rob, uh, Brad had so many different positions. I'm not going through his life um, here, but uh, it's always good to have you as a sobering voice of what is happening in the US. Nonetheless, being self-critical about what has happened in the past and possibly what happened in the future. So that's the lineup of our speakers that have, they all have five to 10 minutes to say what they want to say, actually. Um, and then uh, we'll basically go into a moderated discussion with the panelists so that they basically can exchange a little bit and heat you as the audience up to then come in in the question and answer session. So the Q&A, you can start writing whatever kind of questions you have into the chat already. That's one way of reaching us. And uh, the second way of reaching us is after the, uh, after the discussion um, to just raise your hands. I hope this is technically possible for everybody. Uh, you will see in your, um, in, in your board that there's an opportunity to have reactions or smileys and there there's the opportunity to raise hand. I hope you all have that one. Um, we have until half past six uh, European time. So 90 minutes. I have used already eight of this. I don't want to waste more. But the last thing I'm going to hopefully do now or post in the chat is because I'm only the moderator. Those people who have really written important things about it are basically my colleagues, Sophia Becker, who has organized this event, uh, and uh, my colleague, Betty Sue, who have written on the topics. And I'm posting that in the chat. So um, read it for later. Uh, but now it's time to listen to Jessica as the first speaker, uh, giving us an idea of what is actually NATO deterrence and do we need all this? Jessica, please. Great, well, thank you so much for having me here and for organizing this event. I'm very pleased to be here uh, with such great uh, fellow panelists as well. Uh, I do have to start off with the caveat that of course, uh, I'm speaking in my NATO official capacity. Uh, those who know me know that I come from the US government, but I am not going to comment on any US government uh, specific policies. I'm here uh, to talk about NATO. Uh, so with my caveat out of the way, let me uh, dive into what is NATO's nuclear policy? Well, how do we think about NATO nuclear deterrence uh, and capabilities and, and the future of our deterrence? 
So first, it's good to start with history. Uh, NATO's nucle nuclear weapons have really been the foundation of alliance security guarantees since the very foundation of the alliance. Uh, as NATO leadership have repeatedly stated over the years, the fundamental purpose of NATO's capabilities is to preserve peace, prevent coercion, and deter aggression. Furthermore, as you uh, have probably read in any number of uh, NATO statements over the years, and will continue to see in future ones, is that NATO will remain a nuclear alliance as long as nuclear weapons exist. That said, um, we, uh, the alliance has furthermore been clear that the circumstances in which NATO might contemplate the use of nuclear weapons are extremely remote. Uh, that said, uh, we use nuclear weapons every day for deterrence, and that is to affect the thinking of our competitors and to prevent any potential adversary from taking actions that we don't want them to take. This is the foundation of what deterrence is and the reason that we still have nuclear weapons uh, for the security of NATO. So how do we do this? In order to influence a nation, to deter it from taking action, we must have three things. First, we must have credible capabilities. Second, we must have the resolve or the political will to use those nuclear capabilities if, if needed. And third, we must have an effective way to communicate both our capabilities and our political will in both peacetime and in conflict. How these factors are perceived by our potential opponents and their judgment to act or not to act defines the success and effectiveness of NATO's nuclear deterrent. So let me talk a little bit more about this. The first element of this equation, NATO's nuclear deterrence capabilities, are of course uh, fundamentally comprised of the strategic nuclear forces of the NATO's three nuclear weapon states the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. Uh, the US and UK specifically extend their deterrence to NATO allies, while France maintains its independence uh, and its strategic for nuclear forces independently. NATO's nuclear capabilities also uh, include unique nuclear sharing arrangements. Now, nuclear sharing is not the sharing of nuclear weapons. But it is, uh, the United States maintains full custody and control of its nuclear weapons as required by the NPT. That said, nuclear sharing is the sharing of NATO's nuclear deterrence mission, the political responsibilities and decision making across the alliance. It's also about sharing responsibility for the operational mission. This includes the nuclear weapons deployed in Europe by the United States, the national contributions of dual capable aircraft by European allies, and the additional capabilities and infrastructure provided by European allies to support the nuclear mission. It is important that all of these capabilities, national nuclear arsenals, dual capable aircraft, and conventional support capabilities remain credible in order to provide an effective deterrence against potential adversaries. That is why investing in new uh, air aircraft and modernized weapons is so important to the Alliance. NATO allies, except France, also share the responsibility for all nuclear planning and policymaking through their participation in NATO's nuclear planning group, which is the senior decision-making body on nuclear policy issues for the Alliance. This allows allies to maintain full political control over nuclear decision-making, meaning that no operational or tactical or policy issues are deferred to NATO's military authorities at any point, either in peacetime or in conflict. The MPG must authorize all nuclear-related actions and activities. All this put together means that NATO has separate centers of decision-making, the US, the UK, France in their national capacities, and NATO as an alliance, which contributes to deterrence by complicating the calculations of any potential adversary. As any adversary would have to act not only to calculate what one of these actors might do in a conflict, but would also have to consider what NATO would do collectively. 
And this brings me to the second element of deterrence, which is political will or resolve. The collective decision-making and nuclear sharing arrangements are important signals of political unity to any adversary. We demonstrate resolve through our political statements, our summit communiques, and our other policy documents. And we'll have the opportunity to do this again in the upcoming summit communique in June, and then in the renegotiation of our strategic concept over the coming year. These documents and statements are also important examples of how we communicate our capabilities and our resolve publicly. But we also communicate through exercises, through our press statement, and through direct engagement with other nations, including uh, to the publics at events like these. Communications is an incredibly important element of our nuclear deterrence because we must be able to send clear signals in both peacetime and in conflict in order to reinforce our unity and resolve and to reduce the risk that our adversaries will miscalculate or misunderstand our actions in conflict. Unfortunately, the business of nuclear deterrence has only become more critical for transatlantic security over the past decade. Once again, we see Russia building up its nuclear forces and diversifying its nuclear delivery systems and its platforms. For example, Russia has steadily modernized its ICBM force, replacing its legacy Soviet era missiles with new multiple warhead missile systems that are both silo based and road mobile. Russia has also steadily increased the scope and scale of its arsenal of medium range and intermediate range missile systems including its caliber sea launch cruise missile, its Iskander ballistic missile, and the SSC-8 screwdriver missile system, which was the system that violated the INF treaty, uh, all of which can deliver either nuclear or conventional warheads. These short and intermediate range missiles are designed to threaten allied unity, hold critical infrastructure at risk, target uh, our critical military targets from both conventional and nuclear strikes, and of course, undermine our cohesion. Russia's continued investment in this diverse array of dual-use missile systems raises serious concerns about its regional tensions, its regional intentions, and creates added risk of escalation and misperception in times of crisis. As of today, Russia can reach any point on European territory with these missile systems without warning and with all, only limited ability by NATO to defend. And perhaps most disconcerting from a NATO perspective, according to experts, Russia possesses approximately 2,000 uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons, including those that can be deployed on its air, ground, and sea launch cruise missile systems. In contrast, NATO allies have between 200 and 250 non-strategic nuclear weapons. The majority of those are the B-61 US nuclear gravity bombs deployed in Europe. In addition to these theater range systems, in his State of the Nation address in March 2018, President Putin announced a number of so-called novel nuclear capable systems. These include Russia's hypersonic missile systems, which Russia is now developing and deploying. In December of 2019, Russia announced that its avant-garde hypersonic glide vehicle had entered operations, and we've seen it test its uh, caliber ballistic, or sorry, its um, Sircon uh, hypersonic cruise missiles and its Kinzhal air launch ballistic missile systems several times over the past year. Russia is also developing its nuclear-powered nuclear cruise missile system, as well as underwater unmanned nuclear-powered torpedo, the Poseidon. Russia has renewed an increasing reliance on nuclear weapons, in addition to its expanding arsenal in countries like China and North Korea, means that NATO's status as a nuclear alliance remains relevant and important to addressing the security needs of allies both today and into the future. While NATO does not want to engage in a nuclear arms race and has no intention to deploy new ground launch nuclear missile systems of its own, we are seeking ways to ensure that our current capabilities remain credible and effective in light of this changing security environment. This includes steps to increase the survivability and resilience of our own nuclear capabilities, to modernize our nuclear forces, and to reduce the risk of misunderstanding or mistake. 
But in an increasingly complex security environment, NATO's nuclear capabilities remain critical to deterring Russia and any other potential adversary. There are important signals of our political unity, not only towards our adversaries, but also to reassure allies that we remain committed to their security. This is why NATO leaders have been clear and will continue to reiterate that as long as there are nuclear weapons in the world, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. So let me start there and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Jessica, thanks, thanks so much, so much for, for outlining the, or giving us the lay of the land actually. And uh, I'm happy to give the word to Bruno now, whether he shares that view and what he wants to like to add. Bruno, please. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I was listening to Jessica, it was a pleasure as usual. I'm not here to give the French perspective, but a French perspective, uh, which is uh, sometimes, my own perspective is sometimes closer to that of Jessica's than that of my uh, government's. So let me give my own personal perspective anyway. Uh, the way I see it, I believe uh, the NATO nuclear deterrence system or mechanism faces three challenges. Um, one of them is who may we be, uh, who may we have to deter in the coming 10 years? Um, are there any other countries which could pose a det nuclear deterrence challenge to, uh, to us uh, other than Russia? And that's a big question mark. My very short answer for debate would be any other country, well, an East Asian country would be an Atlantic Alliance challenge more than a NATO challenge. And I'm happy to discuss that. My second observation, the second challenge is that I see elements of fragility in nuclear sharing. Some of them are very well known and are not new. Um, obviously, because of the coming elections in Germany, all eyes will be uh, turned to Berlin. Let me just say at this point that I don't believe that it would be easy for any German government to put into question uh, its participation in nuclear sharing. I think it would be a huge step to cross, and I'm very happy to be uh, contradicted uh, by German experts here who know the domestic situation much better than I than I do. But even with a green-led government, I think it would still be um, an, if such an important uh, barrier to cross that I'm not sure it would happen, which doesn't mean, of course, that the challenge of budgets um, and procurement for majority European countries and smaller ones also does not, uh, does not uh, remain. I'm happy also to hear from, I see that uh, my friend Sinan Urgen and maybe other Turkish experts are here. I continue to think that the current Turkish government could at some point uh, raise, pose a uh, nuclear sharing or nuclear stationing or nuclear basing challenge. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've always imagined Mr. Erdogan being willing and able in some circumstances, not necessarily the current ones, to do what I call to do with the goal. That is, no more nuclear weapons, uh, no more foreign nuclear weapons on my side. Whether it's a credible hypothesis or not, I think it would be foolish not to put it in, in the back of our minds. But again, I stand to be uh, corrected or contradicted by Turkish expertise leader. Then there's a third challenge, which is uh, the intention by the current US administration to review US, uh, US declaratory policy in a way which is not currently um, uh, well articulated with how NATO thinks about nuclear weapons today. And um, although I'm not sure at all, but I, I'm happy to hear from Brad and others about this, not sure at all that um, the US administration would go as far as adopting a sole purpose um, declaration, my inclination would be to think that they will try to go slightly below, sorry, sorry slightly beyond the uh, 2010 nuclear past review, but not go much very far. I was reading the other day to prepare for this seminar um, what Leonardo Tomero said uh, to Congress the other day, and I was, uh, I saw some little 
signs of a willingness to um, do not to not give too much importance to the current um, NATO nuclear arrangements. I mean, when uh, in our business, uh, in the policy business, whether it's nuclear uh, or any other business, when you replace when you replace a V with an E, provide a political and military link instead of provide or are an essential political and military link, it, it matters. So I'll be happy to hear what Brad and others uh, read from Leonardo Tamiro's uh, statement. So we have a possible doctrinal challenge from the United States. And I've always thought that it would be very difficult for the Biden-Harris administration to reconcile two objectives. One is to rejuvenate and ensure the cohesiveness of alliances on the one hand, and to go forward on the past for a reduce role for nuclear weapons on the other. Again, this is a challenge that Brad and others have known uh, in 2009, but I still think that um, we may have a potentially divisive uh, nuclear deterrence debate and one in which the German voice, uh, where it, whatever it is after September, will be an extremely important uh, component. Um, no, um, no, uh, picture of the current Atlantic Alliance nuclear terms landscape would be complete without saying a word about the UK. Um, I think it's remarkable whether if one thinks it was a good thing or a bad thing, it's remarkable that the UK has gone for fully French, if I may say so. I mean, it's I, most of us did not anticipate that the UK would rather radically uh, alter its nuclear terms discourse in a way which make the French very comfortable in the sense that uh, we no longer at this point, we, we do not um, have this slight difference of view on the balance between deterrence and disarmament that we used to have with London. And also um, the, um, the, the general posture of the UK makes the French very comfortable. So we face an intriguing situation where in fact, uh, you may have a London-Paris axis which faces a potential Washington challenge in the coming months. That would be uh, interesting. Um, I won't say anything about the question of disarmament and arms control, how much this uh, should fit in, because I'm sure that others are well, a better position than I am. I would just emphasize how much uh, what Jessica said about communication is important. Uh, the way I see it in the 21st century uh, crisis, strategic communications are even more important than they were uh, in the 20, 20th century. And I look forward to possible improvements of how uh, we can ensure that um, the NATO um, uh, defense and deterrence community, so to say, uh, continues to be uh, uh, very active and thinking about how we would communicate in a crisis. I'm, uh, I'm not reassured by the fact that, uh, um, that um, uh, European governments uh, do not do a lot of um, uh, political military war gaming and are not necessarily trained for nuclear crisis, nuclear related crisis. I know that uh, under Jessica and uh, her predecessor's leadership, uh, this has been rejuvenated in NATO itself. Um, I'm not entirely sure that my own country is entirely up to date on the, the strategic communications uh, problem. And I will leave it at that. Bruno, thanks very much. Thanks for, for raising the, the issue of upcoming challenges. Um, uh, I think that provides a good runway into the, uh, into the further discussion. Next on my list is Moritz Kutt from the EFSR. Please, Moritz. Yeah, thanks, Christian, and uh, thanks to the other speakers here. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to speak about uh, not, of course, the theory of nuclear deterrence. I think this is not the audience uh, for that. I want to speak about two issues, uh, and that is nuclear sharing and uh, nuclear arms control. Uh, before I do so, some introductory remarks. Uh, I think we can all agree that NATO faces numerous challenges. And in a sense of an image, one could see a bumpy road, a road that has even roadblocks on it uh, for the future. And if we stick in this image, I sometimes have the feeling that NATO is a car that drives on this road, but it has a steering wheel that, that doesn't really work well. I mean, it, it, either we can't really steer to different directions or we can't avoid these roadblocks. NATO knows where it wants to go. It knows the destination. Uh, it wants to be 
uh, a place for a safe and secure future for the Alliance members. It wants to actually help build a more peaceful world. And it wants to reach a world that is free of nuclear weapons. But I would say NATO still has difficulties finding the right way to this. And uh, the chance to discuss a new strategic concept uh, is a chance to reassess uh, the situation and probably implement new ideas and see if we can also find new ways uh, to get to these uh, destinations. For example, on nuclear sharing, as uh, Jessica has already listed, nuclear sharing is this concept where um, the US stations nuclear weapons in five NATO member states and the NATO member states um, have aircraft that could be used to deliver these weapons. And this sharing arrangement is said to be beneficial for NATO unity and cohesion, uh, and also as a focal point for consultation and coordination as for example, uh, in the nuclear planning group. And both the lack of unity and cohesion, as well as the need for improved consultations are points that were pointed out by, by the reflection group, this group led by Thomas de Maizière that released a report uh, last year. They highlighted this as future challenges and the NATO Secretary General took this up in his Food for Thought paper that he released in February. The weapons are also believed to serve as a local or forward deployed deterrent uh, in the region or in a theater battle field. And they also believed to show uh, the commitment by allies, in particular by the US, that the US would actually uphold its promise of extended deterrence to its allies. So for these four functions, uh, NATO currently relies on uh, gravity bombs from the 1970s uh, that will be dropped by aircraft. But the weapons undergo lifetime extension or modernization at very high cost, uh, and the aircraft actually need to be modernized, at least in Germany. The other states already modernized these aircrafts. And so we can debate whether or not these weapons really serve these functions, but I think this is not uh, what we should do. And then we should go a step further in the image of the steering wheel. And we could put ourselves in a situation where there would be no gravity bombs deployed and the countries would not spend uh, enormous sums on new aircraft. And they would have the sum to probably be spent on something else. And one could say, okay, we could ask the US for something else than these gravity bombs, whatever it is. And if that's the situation, I believe, we would never really pick you know, this specific set of, of um, items uh, to actually serve these four functions I listed before. We might uh, come up with many different uh, solutions, many different ideas. Uh, and this is what the debate in the next strategic concept should be about. And I believe it could actually include uh, an end of nuclear sharing as it currently is. And there could be other ways to serve these four functions I've listed. Um, let me turn to nuclear arms control, um, as this is another element of NATO's nuclear posture. And I think it's interesting um, that, um, sorry, I mean, NATO, since 1967, nuclear arms control is a key element of, of NATO's strategy. I mean, in the Harmon report, it was said that NATO should um, have a, an idea of deterrence and detente. So they would both go hand in hand. So the deterrence that NATO has and arms control would go hand in hand. In the 2010 expert commission, which is the last strategic concept, um, the commission said the stability, transparency, predictability, lower levels of armament and verification, which can be provided by arms control and non-proliferation agreements, support NATO's political and military efforts to achieve its strategic objectives. So it was made clear that arms control is an important element. But there are some caveats. Uh, prior to 2010, uh, one could say that the arms control efforts by NATO are mainly surplus arms control. Uh, so there was dismantlement of weapons that were kind of surplus that were not needed anymore or not need, or you know that regulated the control of then strategically unnecessary weapons. Whenever it mattered, whenever it could have made a dent in, in the set of nuclear weapons that we basically all want to get rid of in the future, um, NATO shied away from new initiatives and courageous decisions. In 2010, then, NATO defined itself as a nuclear alliance. So the strategic concept in 2010 is the first that explicitly mentions this. As long as nuclear weapons are in the world, NATO remains a nuclear alliance. And since then, and I'm not saying that there is a correlation or a causation, but it, it's just an observation. Since then, we have seen a demise of key arms control agreements. Uh, afterwards, we saw the end of the INF Treaty. We, we are currently watching the end of the Open Skies Treaty. We nearly not, lost New START. Luckily, we still have it. And the JCPOA also is in question as a non-proliferation agreement. And of course, it's not NATO to blame for this. I mean, there's actions by the rest of the world that 
uh, need to be held accountable. But what NATO um, can be or should should reassess is is what it did in the meantime. So the strategy from an outside view was basically stand aside and watch and complain that this is how the world goes. Um, and then also um, looking at how we can reinforce uh, armaments and um, have military modernizations. But I think this is not enough. In fact, it's counterproductive. I mean, we all agree that we don't want a new uh, arms race, neither conventional nor nuclear. Uh, so I think arms control actually needs to be part of a NATO strategy. And there was a question in the, um, in the invitation, uh, how can effective arms control measures be a part of a sound NATO strategy? And I would say the NATO strategy can only be sound if arms control actually plays a role in that. And to give some examples what this could be, let me, let me end with four suggestions that we can also discuss further. We already mentioned the first, which is um, a sole purpose doctrine, uh, either by the US or by NATO at large. This would really show the determination of NATO to get to a world free of nuclear weapons sooner or later by showing that NATO would not be the first um, to use nuclear weapons. A smaller but still important step could be an initiative by NATO to, to make all countries ratify the CTBT. That's you know, a limited arms control treaty, but still there's the US that hasn't ratified this treaty. And it would be a sign of showing the importance of arms control if NATO could actually uh, get together and say this, this would be an important step for the nuclear strategy. Then I discussed nuclear sharing. We could come up with new ideas on how we want to see the future of nuclear sharing. If nuclear sharing would come to an end, this would open up opportunities to discuss uh, with Russia and others whether non-strategic nuclear weapons could be part of future arms control agreements. As part of this, one could also discuss at what point in the UK and France, uh, and of course China, um, would, be, would be part of uh, these arms control agreements that so far um, for strategic weapons have only related to the US and, and Russia. And lastly, uh, there is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. It entered into force in January this year, uh, but NATO really is, is uh, negligent to this treaty, uh, and it should at some point at least accept that this treaty exists. This treaty exists, it's in, entered into force, it has 45 member states, which are bound by all the regulations of this treaty. And I think uh, for the strategic concept, there should be a way uh, of constructively dealing with this treaty. I at least personally believe that uh, there might be a state in NATO that would join this treaty in the next, let's say, 10 years, which is the time frame of the strategic concept. And so it would be good if the strategic concept is, is prepared for that case, uh, at least in some way or another. And with this, uh, I thank and look forward to the discussion. Always, oh, thanks very much. So we have some interesting proposals for arms control that don't, do not completely contradict NATO, which I think is a, is a good way forward, possibly. But let's see what Brad says about this and other things that we have discussed so far. Brad, please. Christian, Sophia, thanks so much for the opportunity to join the discussion. Uh, thank you for creating the discussion. It's great to see so many people interested in re-engaging on these subjects after what seems to have been a very long period of disengagement and, and, and disinterest. Uh, I should start by being clear that I'm speaking for myself. I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer, uh, and, and I do so from my background, both as an Obama administration official and as a longtime analyst of these issues. Uh, and, and in my 10 minutes, I'd like to make uh, four basic arguments. Uh, the first is that when we talk about NATO's nuclear deterrence, what most of us think is about the organization. And we think that uh, when, when NATO's uh, director for nuclear policy comes and speaks, she's representing the views of an organization. Uh, these, are the, these are the principles that heads of state and government have set out repeatedly over decades. Uh, what strikes me about the, the summary of uh, NATO nuclear policy that Jessica gave us is its deep continuity, despite big changes in the security environment over many decades, and despite political changes in all of our countries of various kinds, these basic principles remain in place. Now that's either because we've been stubborn or ineffective, or it's because 
They've been subjected to renewed discussion in each new context and some tinkering done, but more or less found to be fit for purpose. Uh, my second argument is about one of the core tenets of NATO nuclear policy is that um, deterrence and defense must be based on an appropriate mix of nuclear conventional and missile defense capabilities. Appropriate mix. NATO has said this for decades. It, uh, it didn't always say missile defense. That got added to the catechism in 2011. But um, it, it was sufficiently controversial in 2011, and there was sufficient debate in the alliance about the appropriate mix of nuclear and non-nuclear means of deterrence that these issues couldn't be settled in the context of the rewriting of the strategic concept that occurred at that point. And so a follow-on activity was convened, the Deterrence and Defense Posture Review, which resulted in a separate uh, document. And I think as we look ahead to the new process of writing a new strategic concept or an updated strategic concept, we're going to find even more fundamental disagreements in the alliance about the appropriate mix. Uh, and uh, this is because the defense piece of it is still a bit of a jumble. We have a missile defense policy that says we will uh, have a Euro European missile defense against threats from outside the Euro-Atlantic security environment, meaning it's not about Russia, but NATO has an, a policy on integrated air and missile defense that says it's about any potential threat. Well, that would include Russia. Um, I could give you many other examples. I'm just making an argument that, that the uh, apparent consensus in the alliance on the appropriate mix isn't very deep. Uh, and this is probably reflected in the main conclusion of the 2012 Deterrence and Defense Posture Review that said the then existing mix of capabilities, nuclear and non-nuclear, was appropriate, but it didn't, didn't explain what the mix was or why it was appropriate or what might be necessary to ensure that it would remain fit for purpose over the longer term in a changing security environment. And the commitment to remain fit for purpose was the closing thought in, in that review. My third argument is about the Biden administration. Uh, it has arrived with big ambitions in the nuclear policy realm. And you, you're all familiar with these. Uh, it, it arrives with big ambitions, just like all its predecessors. Every new administration has arrived believing that it's inherited a nuclear mess from its predecessor, that it's inherited too many nuclear weapons, too much nuclear risk, out of date nuclear policy, and there's an opportunity to really do a lot of big important new things. And like these predecessors, the Biden administration will confront some unhappy realities. Uh, so it has two big ambitions, as you know. One is to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in US uh, defense strategy. One might say further reduce the role. The, redu the role has been reduced quite substantially uh, over the last three decades uh, to, to be, today being to protect the United States and its allies from in, in the extreme circumstances when they face threats to their vital interests, whether nuclear or non-nuclear. And to further reduce the role means saying that there is some threat to a vital interest that we're not going to protect or try to protect by, by nuclear means. That doesn't bother a lot of allies who don't feel threats from non-nuclear means, but there are some who do, very much so. Um, one, of, one of the unhappy realities of thinking about further reducing the role of nuclear weapons and U.S. defense strategy is that others have been unprepared to follow. China is not prepared to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in its defense strategy. On the contrary, 
Russia is not prepared to do so. We're left with the question of doing so unilaterally. Moritz has offered the argument that that this may create the conditions for non-strategic nuclear arms control in Europe. And it may. The Russians have told us for a long time that it, that it would. Um, but they have been so far unwilling for decades to join in the process of reducing NATO in the decade after the Cold War reduced its uh, the, the, the forward deployed U.S. nuclear weapons by 97%. In that period, the number of Russian non-strategic nuclear weapons went up. So a, a third alternative for trying to reduce the role is to proceed with conventional substitution, to take nuclear weapons off of intercontinental ballistic missiles and put non-nuclear weapons on the top, or to roll in a lot more missile defense. And the problem with conventional substitution is that it may reduce the role for the United States of nuclear weapons but it doesn't relieve China and Russia of the need to maintain uh, substantial nuclear forces against that, that, that US capability. They actually fear non-nuclear attack more than nuclear attack. So I'd say there's one other dimension that's being debated about reducing the role of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that's the, the last NPR said there are four roles. One is to deter nuclear attack on the United States. The second is to, to be capable of restoring deterrence once it's failed at the lowest possible level of damage. The third is to extend protection to US allies. And the fourth is to hedge against a future breakdown in the security environment of a kind that might create new nuclear demands. And one, one proposal is just to lop off the second, third, and fourth roles to say that US nuclear weapons no longer have a role in hedging against an uncertain world, protecting allies, or responding in the case of a failure of deterrence. They just exist to deter. Uh, and as Bruno has already observed, any of these measures for reducing the role are going to clash directly with the president's desire to re revitalize, renew, and strengthen our alliances after the period of damage done in the recent past. Uh, a second ambition that the administration has, of course, we've already mentioned, to adopt sole purpose. Uh, the president uh, clearly arrives in office with this ambition. Uh, so did President Obama. And President Obama, uh, together with Vice President Biden and his cabinet in 2009, looked at this closely. Uh, and heard from quite a few allies in Europe and Asia uh, that they were worried about the further erosion of extended nuclear deterrence. And they were concerned in a, an increasing way about the credibility of US nuclear guarantees to them. Uh, and they were concerned about the signal that would be sent to their nuclear armed neighbors about the resolve of the United States and its allies to defend their interests. And they were concerned about non-nuclear threats to their vital interests. Not all allies, but I can tell you a good number. Uh, and so the Obama administration embraced a two-step approach, uh, a narrowing of the role of nuclear weapons and declaratory policy in 2009, but a commitment to try to create the conditions that, that would allow us to uh, move in that direction in a second Obama term. And none of those conditions were, were, were created. So the, the, the Biden administration arrives with big ambitions, just like its predecessors. Uh, and it's, and it's going to come up against some hard facts that will, I think, lead to choices that will, in the end, disappoint those with high expectations. Fourth and final argument. Uh, about um, NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements and Germany's role in them. Uh, in, in my estimation, Germany's role in them is vital to the functioning of the nuclear sharing arrangements. I cannot imagine a circumstance in which Germany were to withdraw from that role and the rest of the remaining team would choose to stay in the game. 
Uh, Germany's choice about how to proceed is de facto cho the choice about the future of NATO's nuclear deterrent. And this is why in 2009, the, uh, the Obama administration policy was that no NATO member should make decisions about NATO's nuclear deterrent. NATO should make decisions about NATO's nuclear deterrent, which were made at the head of state le level in, in 2010. Um, I, I, I take a slightly different view from Moritz of the, the role and functions of uh, the sharing arrangements. Let, let me sketch out just a slightly different argument from his and then we can compare them. It, it's absolutely the case that the sharing arrangements are products of the Cold War. I don't think that makes them relics of the Cold War, uh, to use the term that uh, then Foreign Minister Vestervella used. Uh, from an alliance perspective, it took a decade to figure out the sharing arrangements. Uh, it took a decade to figure out all of the competing interests and problems that were at play for the alliance in the 1960s. The alliance felt it had a general problem uh, with the credibility of the U.S. nuclear guarantee once the American homeland became vulnerable to Soviet attack. And there needed to be a way to establish a clear link between nuclear war in Europe and nuclear war involving the American homeland. And there needed a clear way to demonstrate that an attack on one by nuclear weapons would be an attack on many who would be implicated in the response. From a US perspective, there were two key interests at play in the 1960s. One was to ensure that allies would share in the burdens and risks of deterrence and war. And secondly, there was a desire to constrain the, the new piece of elements of nuclear autonomy within the alliance, as the British and the French were proceeding to develop nuclear war plans of their own, there was a desire to make sure that none of us dragged each other into a nuclear war that no one wanted. And from a European perspective, there was a strong desire to ensure that it, there, it would have a seat at the table when the American president was considering whether or not to employ American nuclear weapons in support of alliance commitments. And there were two competing impulses. European leaders wanted to ensure that the president would not employ nuclear weapons when they were not absolutely required. And they wanted to ensure that he would employ nuclear weapons when absolutely required, recognizing we might not. Now, of course, the strategic context has shifted dramatically and twice, in fact, since, since that period. Um, today, we face a situation with a nuclear armed ally, uh, adversary who's prepared an approach to regional nuclear war, to regional war, first and foremost, with a nuclear component that clearly believes in nuclear-backed coercion and seems to believe in the, the winnability of limited nuclear wars because they can be kept limited and because they doubt our resolve to defend our interests. So I see the sharing arrangements as relevant to this current strategic landscape. The problem of credibility of American nuclear threats remains. Nuclear deterrence is still well served by the transatlantic link and by the prospect of a collective response. The US still wants a sharing of nuclear burden we're really not prepared on a bipartisan basis to see European allies relieve themselves of this burden and leave it to us to do the job. Uh, and I can't imagine that, that European allies would think this is a good time in the transatlantic relationship to give up a seat at the table where these decisions might be made. So I see the sharing arrangements as having a strategic logic in the current security environment, uh, I see the sharing arrangements as um, uh, critical to the overall credibility of the deterrence posture. And I think German withdrawal would spell the end of the sharing arrangements. So thank you for the opportunity to weigh in, Christian. Over to you. Brad, thanks very much. Always great listening to you and the way that you 
develop the argument. Um, you have put out, you all four have put out quite an interesting landscape here. I was wondering what is the best question to to put this all together also with regard to a to not the audience but part of the audience that is of course a a, a german audience and i think maybe one question because that's that's an interesting from very dimensions for the germans is the question of as to what extent does um chinese ambitions really change the picture is that the one key thread that Bruno mentioned that we have to um, that we have to basically uh, engage first? Is it an issue for arms control? Um, what are the the strategies? I'm saying this because that also and, and for NATO and I also had the impression that what, what, what Brad said there's a lot of still a focus on on Russia on all these things. And that is very much also, if I look into my own country, very much a kind of a, a you know, the, the cage where we are in and where we can't possibly open up. At the same time, my current government has been much more sensible or responsive to what is happening in Asia slash China. So there is an interest in general on what is happening and a kind of you know, a, a growing concern about this. Um, not necessarily on the nuclear side, but I think that's part of the equation because what, that's what Brad said. So I guess the, the kind of the unifying question to all of you, and then I will immediately open up to the to, to the audience because there have been a lot of questions coming up, is how does China change the picture in, in this? And maybe maybe Jessica, I'm not sure, can, can I start with you? Are you ready to, to give a first shot on this? And I'll just go then with you, Bruno, and Moritz and Brad again just sharp, crispy answers, and then I go to the audience. The audience can start if they want to, raise some of their hands if they want to put up a question kind of within the group. Jessica, please. Great, I'm, I'm happy to start off. Um, before I turn to China, just a, a couple of quick reflections on some of the topics that were raised by other panelists that I think might help contribute to the discussion. Um, I wanted to um, talk just briefly to Moritz's point on the cost of dual capable aircraft and the aircraft modernization. Um, I think it's important to recognize that these are aircraft that have a primarily conventional role. Their nuclear responsibilities are, are in addition to that. And so these aircraft are, are largely procured and used in a conventional capabilities every day. DCA aircraft are flying in Syria. They're flying in Baltic air policing. They do a, a play a very important conventional role for NATO. So getting rid of NATO nuclear sharing arrangements doesn't reduce the cost in any way to allies um, for procuring uh, fifth generation fighters and more sophisticated aircraft. This is an additional responsibility that's on top of that. So I think it's important to understand the procurement aspects of, of DCA, which is, a, which is basically a sunk cost. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight, I'm, I'm obviously not in charge of NATO's arms control strategy as the deterrence person, um, but NATO does place a very important uh, emphasis on arms control in, in our security strategy. And I think that is very well reflected in our summit statements, um, in our you know, recent statements on uh, the importance of the MPT and the importance of New START uh, extension. Uh, allies are, are very attuned to, to arms control, but as I think Brad very eloquently pointed out, you have to have a, a negotiating partner uh, in order to actually undertake arms control. Um, and certainly while allies are very supportive of the US engaging in, dis in bilateral talks with Russia, as a NATO alliance, we don't negotiate treaties. We support uh, nations in their negotiations. Uh, so while we can emphasize the importance of arms control, while we can coordinate um, positions and, and uh, undertake consultations, which is something we do you know, every day, there, there are several committees at NATO that are, that are looking at both conventional and nuclear arms control efforts. Um, we don't negotiate arms control, and that's just that's just a, a fact of 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 being here at NATO. Um, but it is quite important um, from a security perspective. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to reflect on something that Brad said at the end that the German withdrawal would would potentially end nuclear sharing. 
um, you know, that that is one potential future. I actually think that it might uh, be a catalyst to reshape the nuclear sharing landscape here at NATO and that you might see other allies take up the burden of nuclear sharing if Germany decided uh, to, to withdraw. And that could have, uh, you know, large standing ramifications for, uh, you know, the makeup and the posture of the alliance. But I don't think that it ends nuclear sharing. I, I actually think it it makes our nuclear sharing arrangements uh, look a bit different. Um, and there are a number of allies who uh, don't currently participate in the DCA aircraft role that would be willing to, to do so if Germany decided um, not, not to participate, uh, which would, of course, uh, I think be tremendously detrimental to Germany's you know, really clear voice in the process and their political influence as a, as a leading nation on these issues um, and give uh, you know, kind of reshape the the political discussions that we have, but um, but I I for one think for all the other reasons that Brad uh, outlined that nuclear sharing is an integral part of our our deterrence here, um, and that it's um, that it it wouldn't end, but it certainly would change in dramatic ways. Um, on China, just briefly, um, obviously this is something that the heads of state are going to take up uh, broadly um, next month at the summit. Um, but I think on the, on the nuclear front, um, allies are you know watching what China is doing um, with their own modernization, with their development of the triad, and certainly allies want to see China play a much more active role in arms control and risk reduction. Um, we'd like to see you know more transparency over China's doctrine and policies and posture. Um, but from a from a threat perspective, I think you know it's it's very clear that that Russia is you know our our leading nuclear threat to the alliance, and and I don't think that 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 that's going to change in the short or or medium term. But but the 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 broader uh, China challenge is something that obviously allies are looking at very closely. So I'll just stop there. Thanks, Jessica. Bruno, what about China? I gave a hint of how I thought about it when I said it was kind of a teaser, but I think it's it would be more an Atlantic Alliance challenge than a NATO one. Let me explain what I mean by that. There are circumstances to which one can very well imagine a China veiled nuclear threat or kind of blackmail type during an East Asia crisis where Europe and all NATO felt compelled to express solidarity one way or the other with its friends and allies in the region. If that happened, it's widely anticipated, at least by me, by Brad, and others who've thought about it for more than 20 years, I'm afraid, uh, that um, China would indeed uh, proceed with that kind of threats, and we would have to neutralize that threat one way or the other. Now, if it was against Europe in general, that would be a matter for NATO. Would that be a matter for uh, the NATO nuclear in institutions and procedures? I'm not sure. Would it be a matter for the NAC? Certainly. How would be how would it be treated? I believe it would be treated individually and or collectively by Washington, Paris, and London. That's the way I would phrase it at this point. Of course, if it was a nuclear threat against the US homeland, um, you know, then I could talk about it, but that would be less of a direct concern for the Atlantic Alliance, of course, any, although of course, any, a direct threat against the territory of one member uh, should be dealt with and, and would be potentially an Article 5 contingency. So all in all, I don't think that's our, China, that's our main China topic. I don't think the NATO China China topic, uh, the main China topic for the main China topic for NATO, sorry, today is that kind of scenario. I think there are many China topics for NATO today uh, more urgent than this one, but this is one that we should keep in the background and keep in the back of our minds. So we put it that way. Thanks, Bruno. Moritz, would like to come in. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Yeah, let me um, start, you know, as I, as I was addressed by Jessica with, with basically two questions back. I mean, on the question whether dual capable aircraft serve other purposes, uh, I agree that might be the case for F-35s, which are the aircraft that the Belgians and the Italians uh, have so far uh, said to buy. The German government so far has said that it would buy 30 F-18 aircraft specifically for the purpose of nuclear sharing. At least this is what the government told the parliament uh, a year ago. Um, either they have said something else, which we can't read, that they would use these aircraft for something else, but that's at least the statement I was uh, working with. And if there's something else, uh, probably the German government should also uh, see what other purposes they would have. And on arms control, of course, I'm aware that NATO is not the organization that would actually negotiate arms control treaties. At the same time, NATO is also not an alliance that owns nuclear weapons. Still, it calls itself a nuclear alliance, um, which is basically the same question. I mean, if NATO cannot really make an important uh, effect or important take important steps on arms control, uh, how can it call itself a nuclear alliance if it doesn't own nuclear weapons? Uh, on the China question, how does China change the picture? I think, yes, um, China is one of the players in an ongoing or starting arms race in the world. China is still building up its nuclear arsenal. At least this is what the estimates tell us. It's building up its arsenal slowly and has continued to do so. Uh, while, of course, at the same time, other nuclear weapon states, including uh, the NATO nuclear weapon states, have uh, started modernization efforts uh, and um, now also started to build up their arsenal, or at least announced that they might have a higher cap, which is the case for the UK. So China basically also <laughs> comes into the picture due to a lack of uh, more ambitious arms control efforts, I would say. I mean, if uh, the whole arrangement with New START would have gone quicker to lower numbers. And there was an offer uh, by the Obama administration to some extent, or at least it was talked about to, to go to even lower numbers. We could by now already include China um, at the table in these uh, debates as the Trump administration has tried, of course, with this, we all remember this funny flag uh, idea, uh, which of course was uh, to some sense ridiculous. But of course, we all wish that China would be part of these agreements as uh, France, UK, and probably also the other four states that own nuclear weapons. But to do so, it would have been great if we were at lower numbers by now, and then we could actually you know, match these numbers and integrate them. Brad, would you like to weigh in? With two brief points, Christian. The, the first is that from a nuclear threat perspective, China's a long way away. Uh, it, it's the, the, the slightly concerning point, well, Bruno, Bruno's put his finger on, on one, a possible military contingency in East Asia, uh, where China feels compelled to coerce others outside the region. But um, more troubling for me is the fact that China cannot answer for itself. It doesn't know the answer to the question, well, what, what kind of China is going to come after 2049? The, the current president's uh, objective is to be the, the quote, dominant power. <coughs> Uh, and to pursue a comprehensive major buildup of strategic power towards that end. I don't know what that means. They don't know what that means, but I don't think it's all good news. Um, on the, but the, the nearer term issue is, is, is the arms control issue. And here, just let, let me invite you to engage in a thought exercise. So if, if we're successful in in agreeing with Russia to a follow-on to New START, and that goes into force five years from now, uh, in 2036, what, what might be the balance of forces among the three countries at that point? Uh, by some estimates, China could have outgrown the forces of Russia and, and the United States. That's a prospect that doesn't comfort Moscow or Washington. Uh, and so having some clear understanding of how those three are going to balance out at some point and what that balance would look like and what would make it stable, even on agreeing that it would be stable. Uh, that's not a problem that's 15 years from now. That's a problem that's going to shape whatever the follow on to new start is. I think it's a here and now problem. Thanks, Brad. Thanks so much. So I, I would continue like this, um, all those who kind of 
raise hands, I'll basically try and, and pull in. Otherwise, I've now put into the chat some of the questions, but I think Betty wanted to, to come in um, and ask a question to Brad. Is that correct? And now hands are going up. That's good. Betty, do you want to pose a question? Otherwise, I would be good if you could unmute yourself and possibly switch on your camera. Hi, everyone. Sorry, my internet connection is not stable at all. So um, I'll pose a question like this, if I may. Um, thank you so much, first of all, to the, to the remarks. Super interesting, and I already very much enjoy this discussion. Um, and I have two broader questions, but one first to Brad Roberts. I I understand your line of argument that the Biden administration will probably not succeed in adopting a um, sole purpose policy. So I guess his administration will end up with um, a fundamental purpose policy again, like the, the um, Obama administration or what would you what would you say? And I wonder how this can advance his ambitions of arms control with Russia and maybe other countries, and how can this still um, help increase strategic stability? This is for Brad Roberts. And then to the other three panelists, I would very much um, appreciate if you could react to Brad Roberts' point of, um, in quotes, finding the appropriate mix. So to what extent can nuclear weapons really, in fact, deter existing and emerging non-nuclear threats? And what does this mean for allies in their non-nuclear capabilities? If you could answer this. Thank you. So I don't know where the Biden administration will come out on declaratory policy. It's, it's absolutely clear that that's one of the issues in the review process that will end up on the president's desk. And when it gets there, the president will hear from both his secretaries of defense and state uh, mixed messages. The president will hear that uh, on, on the one hand, our allies are eager and the Department of Defense considers it necessary to maintain some role for nuclear weapons in deterring non-nuclear threats to their vital interests. And on the other hand, they'll hear uh, about the uh, value of uh, additional American steps for promoting US disarmament and uh, non-proliferation and arms control objectives. And in addition, the president will have in mind his commitment to strengthen alliances and it will fall to the president to decide. Uh, and uh, I, I predict uh, without wanting to put a lot of money on a bet uh, that the president will, will decide to essentially repeat the, the uh, policy of the Obama administration. First of all, your, your statement that the fundamental purpose was an Obama articulation. No, it's every American president of the nuclear era has said the fundamental purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attack. The only question is whether that's the, the sole purpose. Um, and I, I'm frankly skeptical that that kind of change to declaratory policy contributes anything to the achievement of nuclear arms control and strategic stability with, with Russia. Uh, there, there are, there are, it's, it's not material to Moscow's calculus so I, I could go on, but in the interest of time, let me stop there, Christian. Thanks, Robert. Siko, you, you were raising your hand. Still up? Are you still interested? Please come in. I think we... Yes, yeah. sorry, I was not allowed to unmute myself. Uh, first of all, thank you all for a very interesting discussion. Um, I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm first before all the people that, that asked a question in the chat. I want to zoom in a little bit on Germany and two other host nations, the, the Netherlands and Belgium, because I think we are facing a similar problem in those three host countries, and that's public opinion. I think that when you talk to most military and security community in those countries, they see the value of 
uh, deterrence from NATO towards Russia, maybe China. But he talked to the general public, to Parliament, different. I think there's a lot of work to do because, especially the the the, the peace organizations working on the TPMW, they have a very nice PR apparatus, and they can convince people that nuclear weapons are bad and deterrence is not necessary, etc. And I, I think there's a problem, you know. And I think NATO should do more on well, working on public opinion, but it's difficult. I think only stating that Russia is dangerous and China is dangerous is not working anymore. You know, we need a more clear message that, well, it, nuclear deterrence, nuclear hosting is important. I do not have an answer for that, but I want to ask to the panel, do you have an answer how to mobilize public opinion more than the TPW organizations are doing now? What kind of message could NATO send? Thank you. That's a very good question. Thanks, Siko. Um, so I've posted all the questions, kind of we synthesized the question, and I've posted them into the chat. So whoever from the panelist side would like to pick up some of the questions, that's absolutely fine. Bruno wants to to your hands. Still, we still have yeah. 15 minutes to go. So whoever wants to, from the audience, wants to weigh in, just please raise your hand or try to catch my eyes by weighing it. Okay, but that's... Um, I think that's uh, up to everybody in, in the panel. And Jessica has has her hand up, and Bruno as well. So shoot, please. Hi, Christian. I'm sorry, I can't see the uh, I can't see the questions and the comments. So uh, ah, there are ones that, that are that are particularly relevant. I'm happy to answer them. But uh, just to just to respond to uh, Siko's question because I think it's it's uh, highly relevant, and it's why I do events like these. This is my. Uh, fourth public engagement in two days, uh, because we are trying to do a lot more public engagement and outreach on uh, nuclear deterrence and why it's still relevant um, and why NATO still thinks it's important. So, so uh, I, I ask you uh, what, what uh, you know, resonates to, to you, because certainly I'm interested in that as well, um, because we do want to, we do want to put out um, a, a strong message, strong in the sense of NATO strong, not a, not a escalatory. And that's a hard, that's a hard balance. Um, and I think that that's the, that's what we've been struggling with. Um, I think it's why, you know, the, the nuclear ban treaty message resonates when you say nuclear weapons are bad and therefore should be banned. It's a very easy message to deliver. Um, you know, I think nuclear weapons are bad too. That's why I don't want to see them ever used, which is why I'm in this business. Uh, but that's a harder, a much more nuanced message to deliver. And so it does take a lot of education. It takes a lot of work. Um, frankly, uh, it takes, um, you know, NATO allied governments being being willing to make the case to their publics. Um, and I think, you know, in, in the Netherlands, for instance, we've seen the, the Dutch government really take on a, a much more proactive role. Uh, and and our, our German uh, new governments are, are doing the same thing as well, I think. Um, you know, uh, the defense minister, uh, German defense minister has been very forward leaning on uh, talking about the continued importance of nuclear sharing and Germany's role in, in nuclear sharing. So, so you know, we're, we have to learn how to talk about nuclear weapons again and, and nuclear deterrence. And it's, it's a skill that's atrophied uh, since the Cold War ended. And it's one that we as an alliance are, are learning how to do again. Um, but we, I think, have really seen a change over the last, uh, you know, 24 months where um, not just the particular DCA allies, but all allies realize that we have to do a better, more effective job communicating our message, um, not just to, to you know, promote uh, support for the mission, although that's um, important for a number of reasons, but also for signaling, right? We, we want to be transparent. We want to be clear about the role of nuclear weapons in, in NATO strategy, the, the fact that you know these are weapons of last resort that we're not you know warmongering we're not irresponsible but we are but we are protecting our citizens and our security um, so that's really the message that we've we've tried to convey um, and it's not easy uh, it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker unfortunately um, but it is but it is one that um, you know I think we as an alliance are now really committed. 
um, to, to, to making a, a more deliberate effort. Um, and which is why, you know, you'll see me at probably 23 more events between now and the end of the summer, uh, because this is a really critical part of um, our responsibility as a nuclear alliance uh, is, to, is to go out and explain that. So I'll, um, I'll stop there and I, I look forward to more questions being read from the chat. Thanks, Jessica. Bruno. We're not public opinion. We're international security experts, diplomats, government officials. We're not public opinion. If by public opinion one understands the public at large, I don't think you can engage it in ways that are commensurate with what happened during the Cold War. In a sense, it's quite fortunate because the debates were extremely uh, passionate. So if it means that the debate is less passionate, uh, but as intense, it's okay. Um, you will not have any one million marches uh, for ratifying the ban treaty uh, in Berlin, in Brussels, and certainly not in Paris. Um, that won't happen. Climate change is the new global zero, period. Now, this doesn't mean that engaging people like those who are in this virtual room and their successes is not important. It is important. And I think many people in this virtual room, and that includes Jessica, that includes Brad, and that includes certainly many others, uh, and I've done my bit, are trying to make sure that the next generations know about nuclear weapons. Uh, they will do whatever they see fit with that knowledge, but knowing about nuclear weapons is a responsibility that those of us who have a modicum of experience in these matters have. So I think it's very important, um, and we all do our bit, I think. And again, whatever one does with that knowledge, if it's to support nuclear deterrence or to, or to support a complete and immediate nuclear disarmament. Now, let me very briefly tackle two points, the appropriate mix. Uh, Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the expression appropriate mix dates from hmm, 1991. Okay, so whatever we think of the appropriate mix today, it's not the appropriate mix of 30 years ago. Um, 91 was a time where the Alliance still thought about scenarios that were more Cold War-like than those we think about today. So today, I don't think the expression is really appropriate in the sense that the connection between nuclear and conventional, even though it does exist, of course, and it may be stronger today than it was 10 years ago, is still weaker than it was 40 years ago. And if you ask me the question of the appropriate mix, I would say that irrespective of what the alliance NATO does in the nuclear domain, I think it probably needs more long-range conventional strike assets to ensure deterrence of Russia. That's the way I would put it. So it's less a question of mix than a question of uh, defining the right capabilities. On the nuclear alliance question that was raised by someone in the audience, uh, there was a seemingly provocative question about how would we react if China, Russia, and or China and Russia uh, declared that they are a nuclear alliance, how would we react? And I think, oh, hey, I don't think they will, but if they do, if it's just a recognition of fact, that's okay. Does that mean that China and Russia will engage into nuclear sharing? Uh -uh, I really don't think so. I'm, I've always been more worried about a potential nuclear sharing arrangement between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia than the scenario you, you just mentioned. So uh, I think it's a saying that NATO is a nuclear alliance is a reality. Proclaiming that it will be one until the end of the universe is a bit of a, hmm, a slightly, uh, how can I put it? Well, I'm not sure I would put it the way NATO does, because to say, to claim that we will be a nuclear alliance as long as nuclear weapons exist um, is a, bit, a little bit too much to my taste. However, as Jessica put it, um, since it has been part of the fabric of the alliance since 1950. And by the way, I can find you a couple of quotes by French generals who said that for the French at that time, 1951, 52, the raison d'etre, the reason to be of being part of the alliance 
was the nuclear element. So that's true. What Jessica says is, of course, true. Uh, so it is in the very fabric of the alliance. It does not mean that the way we collectively as allies think about new we nuclear weapons will be the same in 2040 than it was in 1991. That's the way I would put it. Thanks, Bruno. Anybody else from the uh, from the panel who would like to weigh in? Otherwise, I would give uh, the hand to another question. Then would uh, Alexander, if you would like to come in, Alexander Matla, your hand is still up. You have waited too long. Hi, Alex. Thanks, Christian. Good to see uh, so many of you. I have. Um, one question for Moritz, because if I understood um, the line of argument correctly, well, let's be honest, um, it's the tornado replacement that is really the elephant in the back uh, um, of, of this discussion. And Moritz, your argument is in particular, why spend a large amount of money specifically on the ability to um, undertake the nuclear deterrence mission. I wonder whether that is the, um, the most accurate way of looking at it, um, because speaking from a Belgian perspective, um, we ended up deciding to buy F-35s, not for any nuclear reason, but simply because um, we wanted to sustain having a first-rate air force. And that is an argument I don't hear in the German debate, but that was the deciding one um, on, mm. on our end. Um, and the, the strategic value of having a seat at the NPG is then an extra. We actually did the math. It's cheaper buying F-35s than buying Typhoons. That was the the killer argument in that particular open competition. So if you're not going to buy F-35s or, or what else are you going to do that provides the same amount of strategic value for the uh, German Ministry of Defense? Buy more expensive typhoons with a bit more industrial subsidies as a result of that? Is that strategic? Mm, perhaps, but then what's the argument exactly? Um, getting, um, uh, yeah, an, an empty chair de facto at the nuclear planning group, is that strategic value for money? Perhaps, but then make can, can you make that more explicit? Because I really think that spending uh, the argument of spending lots of money specifically for the uh, the ability to engage in the nuclear mission is actually um, a bit of a populist argument uh, there are all sorts of other reasons why countries like the netherlands belgium uh, italy uh, poland are actually acquiring high-end air forces because it is a multi-functional tool I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Alexander. And I'll pull in also Paul Schulte, who has raised his hand already. And Thank you. Then we can kind of get to the last round with the panelists. Paul, I wanted to, to mention the the British uh, integrated review decisions on nu nuclear numbers, not because they are they are as important, I think, as the the future of nuclear sharing, but they raise certain questions which are worth uh, looking at. Um, it's an increase in future nuclear cap, and that's um, a change from the, the, the long, slow glide down which British nuclear numbers and other people's nuclear numbers have been in in, in, the, in the West for decades. And um, a lot of eyes have been, eyebrows have been raised at this. I, I, I experienced pretty consistent disapproval when discussing this at CIPRI. I was not presenting a case for the British government, but just trying to describe what it was. And the, 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 there was, uh, what I could see was um, nobody liked it. This wasn't the way the world was supposed to be going. Um, it raised uh, 
an un uncomfortable feeling that strategic circumstances could cause nuclear reversals. And um, and I think that that's interesting. I don't think NATO's thought about that so much. The decision to say strategic circumstances have deteriorated so much that we need to improve the amount of nuclear deterrence, at least in numerical and terms, probably others too. That's very uncongenial. Um, and so I'm I'm sort of interested in who, apart from the French, really liked this. Um, how how much disapproval was suppressed for diplomatic reasons, and. Uh, and, and how it carries, carry, carries over. Could NATO ever take that decision after a strategic review to say, hmm, things have got worse, so we, we're going to improve our, our nuclear numbers. We're going to more sharing, big, big, longer range weapons, you know, a number of ways that choice could be made. Could it ever be discussed in, in alliance circumstances? And if, if, it, if it couldn't be and couldn't be chosen, isn't, isn't that a problem? And I think as part of this, because it's about this narrative of um, slow, inexorable downward progress to a global zero, is the question of the TPNW. Um, NATO, we were told NATO ought to engage with it. Um, that sounds good. But what should engagement mean? Um, to accept the TPNW has a lot, number of intellectual problems, which we've no time to talk about, but it has a very practical political problem, I think, um, in relation to a future Scotland. If Scotland does break off, um, uh, it's necessary, I think, to say, well, you can choose not to be a nuclear weapons state, um, but that doesn't mean signing the TPNW, because the TPNW has all sorts of problems with it, which are incompatible with alliance status and, and a realistic appraisal of how the world works. And that problem needs to be thought about not just in Scotland, but in other places, you know, hypothetical NATO, other NATO states that might decide to, to withdraw from nuclear sharing. So it does seem to me that NATO has um, a real interest in calling out the problems here uh, and, and not being soggily diplomatically silent. Now, I do understand, I'm, I'm given to understand that there's kind of esoteric explanation for silence, which is not to upset the non-nuclear weapon states. Because the more you point out the, the problems in the ban treaty, the, the, the less they like it. And I can see that, but I wonder if that problem somewhat goes away after the next review conference. Um, because then one worries less for a while about uh, upsetting the nuclear, the non-nuclear weapon states. Or have I got that wrong? Is that not a factor? So I'd be very interested in a consensus, not a consensus, but a number of views from different di directions. Yeah. Paul, thanks very much. Um, and I'm happy to post that question and all the others that are left open to our panelists. And you have the rich time of one minute to answer because I just don't want to keep you away, now that the audience, from dinner. Okay, so wh who wants to start? Who would like to dinner start? Dinner at 6.30, where are we, in Germany or what? Yes, we do early because we go out to bed early, Bruno. <laughs> I apologize to all my German and American friends. <laughs> no worries. Brad, would you like to start? Yes, well, I'm still working on my morning coffee out here in San Francisco, so uh, I have a little energy left. Um, I want to pick up on one of the comments in the chat function here about um, how do you assess the impact of the development of disruptive technologies on strategic stability? And just in my 30 seconds remaining, give a plug to the piece of work that, that we, my research center, have done together with the European Leadership Network, which is posted at their website, which looks at exactly this question. Uh, we did a review of the available English language literature and then an assessment of the literature. And the simple punchline is that for every hypothesis so far developed about the implications of emerging and disruptive technologies for strategic stability, there is also a counter hypothesis. And the, the debate is widening in various directions. I'll stop. I hope I stuck to my minute. Thank you very much, Brett. Who is next? Who wants to go next? Well, it's you. Yeah, I can yeah, go please. next. Go. Um, one minute, uh, three questions trying to answer. First of all, from Alexander Matela, why don't 
does Germany not buy the F-35? Uh, I guess Bruno can answer this too, but there's the, the AFCA system that the French probably want to build together with the Germans and the German government has decided it would not buy F-35. So this was just not an option. Uh, more, you have to ask uh, the German government on this. Um, then on the question, doesn't do we need a seat at the table? Also something that Brad raised. Um, I basically don't have an answer to this question. What is the role of Germany's seat at this table? We don't, at least me as a, as a researcher, we don't see uh, what is happening at the nuclear planning group. We don't see the role of this uh, seat at the table. And this basically goes to some of the other questions in the chat. I looked at all these questions. They're all interesting questions. And there's some of them I just can't answer. I mean, for example, the question, are the discussions within NATO to realize the sole purpose nuclear deterrence? Uh, as far as I know, this is difficult for me to answer. And then to the last point, the question, why are you know, TPNW uh, proponents so more efficient in their publicity? I think that could be at least one reason why. I mean, if you want to be more transparent and accountable, um, it's probably good to actually tell the people you know, what is happening at these levels. Tell the parliaments, tell the people what is happening on nuclear planning, on nuclear strategy, um, so they can understand either why nuclear deterrence is important or probably why it is not important. But to do so, really this uh, transparency, I think, is, is what is needed. Thanks. Couldn't agree more. Uh, who would like to come next? Jessica, is it you? I can go next and then Bruno can have the final word. Uh, you will um, keep us away from dinner more. <laughs> Uh, as a as a Belgian resident, I, I support the eight o'clock dinners um, here. Uh, so, you know, just a couple of uh, final reflections and, and thoughts. Um, and I apologize, I can't see the, the chats or I could weigh in there. But, um, you know, uh, on Paul's two points, first on the discussions at NATO, and certainly I don't not going to talk about uh, what may or may not have happened behind closed doors, except to say that the, the UK has consulted quite extensively with allies in a number of forums on the integrated review on the rationale um, and the and the reasoning behind the behind the cap. And um, I think the lack of um, public expressions of disapproval uh, don't, uh, you know, kind of reflect what's happening behind the scenes as well. Um, and just kind of more broadly about uh, you know NATO consultations and what isn't and isn't discussed uh, here from a policy perspective. I mean, like any government institution, we we do protect a lot of our discussions, and so that we can have frank and open conversations among allies and among ally governments. But that is again, you know, why why we also do public outreach and and try to explain the rationale for for our positions. And again, we're going to have a number of opportunities to do that in the in the coming year uh, with the summit communique, with the development of the strategic concept, with another summit in 2022, with another summit communique. I mean, these are our tools to talk about these issues uh, and to, to provide transparency um, on, on what we what we do here in, in NATO headquarters and, and the discussion that, discussions that happen between heads of state. Uh, and I would just say, you know, from a broad consultative point of view in, in the committees that I am that I chair uh, and that I support, which is the, the MPG and the subordinate committees, you know, we have a lot of conversations about these issues. Um, but as Brad pointed out earlier, our policies have have fundamentally really not changed in, in decades. And that's not from a lack of discussion about the issues um, and about and recognition of the changing security environments, but that is really, I think, a, a focus uh, or that's a result of uh, understanding that our deterrence you know, hasn't failed in 70 years uh, and that it's um, with ch some changes, some adaptations, it, it remains relevant into the future um, to deal with future challenges. And so, We'll undertake a, a, a broad you know, review of our capabilities and our posture and our policies as part of the strategic concept process. This is you know, really the opportunity to set the, the future direction of the alliance. Um, but much like the U.S. nuclear posture review, uh, you know, my guess is that there'll probably be more continuity than change uh, on our nuclear doctrine and policies as a result of that process. But certainly we will, we take our responsibilities 
as a nuclear alliance um, very seriously. Uh, and we do have a very wide ranging discussions amongst allies on, on these issues. Um, and just one last thing on the on the TPNW, um, you know, NATO has had a number of statements uh, at the NAC level over the TPNW. Um, you know, we have maintained our persistent objector status uh, to the TPNW. Um, you know, it may not be a popular position amongst allied governments in parliament, or sorry, allied publics and parliaments, um, but I don't think that we see any indications that, you know, allied governments are likely to, to sign the ban treaty. I think they understand the, that their um, membership as a NATO ally and, the, and what the ban treaty says are kind of fundamentally at odds at this point in time. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we do engage on, on this issue I, I, you know, our December NAC statement was was kind of the last time we 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 engaged publicly, but um, but you know, allies are are very united on this front. So um, and I don't see that position changing significantly into the future either. So I'll just stop there. Thanks very much, Jessica. Bruno, your last minute. Nothing further to add. It's time not for dinner for APT. So. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But thank you for the conversation. Uh, just one word very quickly. I think many of these discussions, especially in Germany, tend to focus, from my taste, a bit too much on the question of nuclear sharing. I understand how symbolic it is, how important it is. Uh, but I think it's important that the general nuclear conversation within NATO among good friends and allies, even of opposite I, with opposite different ideas does not focus exceedingly on this particular question. I mean, the nuclear landscape is changing. Uh, it's just one component among many. And uh, again, thank you for the Gapi for giving us the opportunity to say a few words about these challenges. And so my side and our side to say thank you to, to all of you, to all of the panelists on the one hand, and also to the audience to be uh, so actively engaged, uh, raising questions live and raising questions in the chat it was very good, serious debate. I like that very much. I'm very grateful to everybody for giving us your time to make this a collective uh, experience that I hope uh, was a constructive one. Thanks also to my team at DJP on the event side and to our researchers that have put this all together. And last but not least to NATO, who had the idea to do this. And I thought it was a good idea. We should do this again. <laughs> <laughs>